Welcome once again to Bethel Baptist Church in Prospect, Connecticut, our YouTube channel during the COVID-19 crisis, and uh, glad you could be with us today. And we're going to sing a hymn, 162 in our hymn book, and it's called To God Be the Glory. So let's begin with a word of prayer. Our Father, we want to thank you for blessing us and keeping us by your great power. Thank you, Father, that there is no one like you. You even said in your word that you looked around and you couldn't find anybody like you at all. We want to thank you for that, Father, that we have only one individual that we need to seek after, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, God manifest in the flesh. So, Father, we ask you to bless this day, give us grace in your sight, bless our brothers and sisters, and keep them also, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. To God be the glory. To God be the glory, great things he hath done. So loved he the world that he gave us his Son, who yielded his life and atonement for sin, and opened the life gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he has done. Oh, perfect redemption, the purchase of God, to every believer the promise of God. The vilest defender who truly believes that moment from Jesus a pardon receives. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory, great things he had done, great things he had taught us, great things he had done, and great our rejoicing through Jesus the Son, but purer and higher and greater will be our wonder, our transport when Jesus we see. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father, through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he has done. Amen. That second verse should have read, oh, perfect redemption, the purchase of blood. Because that's what cleanses us from all sin, the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son. Well, I want to read to you something from Philippians chapter 3 that the Apostle Paul, through the inspiration of the Spirit of God, wrote down for believers today. And it's here in uh, chapter number 3, verse number 7. And we're going to read down through verse number 11. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Paul was a well-educated man. He received great training in, in the uh, places of learning and the Bible, the scriptures. He was a Hebrew of Hebrews who studied the word of God. And uh, it says that he counted those things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus. He says... Eight, in verse 8, Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ, and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. And the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. The Father, give us grace now as we go through the scriptures, and we ask the Father to help us to understand these truths, 
And we pray that, of course, in our Savior Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Now, I will tell you that Christians ought to be the most rejoicing, excited, full of hope of all people on the face of God's earth. Now, I say this because there is available to every human being, ever since the resurrection of Jesus Christ, every human being on the face of God's earth has had the opportunity to have a whole different life before him. And I'm going to tell you that this is only possible because of the resurrection. The apostle here mentions in verse number 10 that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. I'd like to talk to you today about the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Certainly in itself, the resurrection was probably the most powerful thing that ever took place that we can even know of at this time. Other than in the beginning when God created the heavens and the earth, and by the, the words of God, that he created all these things from nothing, just by the word of his mouth. And we talk about that kind of power, that's amazing. But the natural man, the unsaved man, the average church-going man, who isn't born again, doesn't know the Lord nor the Word of God, uh, their minds, when it comes to power, might be uh, a, a powerful storm that uh, can just wipe out a town in a moment, or possibly the, the powerful thrust of sending a missile out in outer space to explore the heavens. And, and I will tell you, when it comes to being a born-again child of God, we have a power available to us, and it's not a physical power, it's something that takes place within our hearts that God has promised us. And he begins that whole process when we repent of our sin and we call upon the Lord Jesus Christ to be our Savior. And our trust does no longer rest in religion, does not rest upon a church membership, does not rest upon a baptism in water uh, for the remission of sins, does not depend on any of that. It depends solely on our belief that Jesus Christ is who he says he is and that he does what he says he does and is going to do what he says he's going to do. That power is available to that type of a person, that type of a believer. So I want to look into those things today because what is it that took place in Paul's life that he was uh, able to write these words down saying that I want to know him and the power of his resurrection. Paul was a, a murderer. He was one who was going out after these new believers uh, in the early days after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And the apostles, they were preaching the gospel all over uh, Jerusalem and Samaria and to the other most parts of the earth. And I will tell you, it's the same gospel that you hear today that's in your Bible. And I want you to know that that's the power of God unto salvation. That's the only thing you can believe. The death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Check it out in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 4. That is the true gospel of the risen Savior, Jesus Christ. And faith in that truth will allow you to have a, a, available to you from the Lord's promise a life that is so altered, so changed that the Bible calls you a new creature in Christ. That cannot happen uh, for an unsaved person. It cannot happen to some religious person or irreligious person. It happens, it's a transaction, an operation that God performs the moment we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and repent of our sinful way. Now I want to tell you this. That that is the power of the Holy Spirit of God. What a joy it is to understand the truths of the Word of God. Listen, when I preach from the, the pulpit, when our men preach the Word of God and teach the Word of God, we teach it as it is in truth, the Word of God. We don't change it. We don't alter it. We don't mix it up and try to make it apply to some Baptist doctrine. We go by Bible doctrine, sound doctrine, good doctrine. And so we can take... Uh, what we believe and show you from the scriptures why we believe it. And so it is with this uh, heart attitude, this mind that we have, that we're looking into this truth about 
what is the power of the resurrection? What does it do for me? Well, first of all, if there was no resurrection, we would be of all men most miserable. It would be foolish to even have a church uh, meeting. It would be silly for us to even uh, record a message like this. It would be a strange thing to, uh, most of this Bible in the New Testament wouldn't be written. It would have ended with, and they placed Jesus in the tomb and they rolled the stone over the mouth of it. And that would have been the end of it. What? Pilgrimages could be made to Jerusalem and they could go to, the, to Golgotha where he was crucified, and Joseph's tomb. And there they could look in that tomb and, and there would be the mummified body of, of this man called Jesus. But he's not there. He's not there. Christians all over the world, uh, people who call themselves Christians, celebrated uh, the, the resurrection of Jesus Christ just a few short weeks ago. But do they understand? Do they know? Do they experience the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ in their own life? Sure, it's an amazing thing. But why should it be something strange that God could do such a thing than to raise somebody up from the dead? And he did it. And I want to tell you something. The Bible says there's going to be a resurrection. And everybody who ever lived, whether they perished in the ocean, whether they perished in the fire, whether they just, they're buried in the ground, they're all going to rise up and stand before the, this Lord Jesus Christ, and he's going to judge them according to their works. Now, for the believer, it's a whole different thing because our trust is not in what we do. Our trust in what is in what Jesus did. And this is why we get the opportunity to experience the power of the resurrection in our own lives. Have you been different? Are you different than you were before you got saved? Or was it just a moment where you said, you know, I think I better do this. Uh, and someone said, well, pray this prayer. Uh, God, I know I'm a sinner. And, and uh, I believe Jesus Christ died. Uh, for my sins, and I ask you to be my Savior. Uh, amen. If, if that was your conversion experience and your life hasn't changed, you ought to check your life out and see whether you are actually in the faith or not. Because I will tell you this right now, that if it's just some words you're expecting that you uttered out of your mouth, uh, God knows your heart. Now, I want to say that this also, that if you did pray those prayers, and since that time... You've heard more of the scriptures, you've understood more uh, of the Bible, the Word of God, uh, and now you're sure that you have the full assurance of faith that what you did was really something you meant now, it's just as valid. But the whole thing pivots on, do you really believe Jesus Christ is the risen Son of God and he's going to be coming back one day to rescue his church from this wicked world before God pours out his wrath upon all the earth. Now, these are not vain imaginations that I'm telling you. These are scripture verses here, prophecies that have yet to come to pass. But again, let's go back. What is this power of the resurrection? Well, Paul's life was completely changed. He did a 180 degree change in his life. The church that he once persecuted, he was now building it up. He was now preaching this glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. Souls were getting saved. Churches were being planted. And people were coming to know the Lord in great numbers. And I'll tell you, those churches, some of those churches are in effect today. And what a glorious thing is, it has developed over the centuries now. And now, here, here back about, let's see, I guess I was 25 years old when I got saved. So, 45 years ago, I got saved. And that gospel is just as powerful today for you to get saved as it was for me then. It was 2,020 years ago uh, when uh, Christ rose from the dead. Now, I want to tell you this here. This power of the resurrection is an amazing thing. Because it's nothing that comes from our natural ability. This power is the power that God... Uh, he, he brings to us and he puts into us by his Holy Spirit. Jesus said in John chapter 14, 15, and 16 about this, this individual called the Comforter. We call him the third person of the, the, the Godhead. He's the Holy Spirit of God. And he indwells every true believer, every born-again believer. That's the difference between you and someone who sits next to you in a church uh, environment and, and, and if you're saved and they're not saved, they're just there. You're there, but you've got the Holy Spirit in you. Now, what's the proof of the Holy Spirit? It's not babbling in tongues. 
It's not talking some silly language that has no understanding that you need somebody to interpret. The, the tongues were for a purpose, but they were known tongues in Acts chapter 2. But that's another thing. What had happened is there's this changed life, the power of a changed life for every believer uh, if they desire it. So, if you call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, God says he performs an operation where his Holy Spirit enters into you. He severs the soul from the, from the body. I don't know how God does such things, but with the, if he just created all things by the word of his mouth, he can do those things uh, with just a thought. Salvation comes through believing the words in the Bible about the risen Savior, Jesus Christ. That's it. God will accept nothing else. We sang in our song about righteousness. We, we read in here in the scriptures just now about uh, Paul saying that not having his own righteousness, which is of the law. What that means, keeping the Ten Commandments or the uh, 600 plus commands in the Old Testament don't provide salvation because the law we're told in the scriptures was our schoolmaster pointing us to Jesus Christ. Trusting in Jesus' finished work, and that's what we do. That's a true born-again believer. Not trusting in how many times he gets to go to church or how many times he's maybe put some money, uh, gave God a tip or something like that in, in the plate. Nothing to do with that at all. It's simply believing the words written and recorded for us in the Holy Bible. That being said, what is the advantage? How is it that Paul could say, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me? How could he say, uh, be careful for nothing, uh, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God, and the peace of God which passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. What, what is it that caused Paul uh, to say things like, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God and Christ Jesus? And I'm going to tell you this, it's because there was a goal now, there was a new, uh, a new end to the, his earthly life where he will be absent from the body and present with the Lord. What is it with us? Why can't we believe God's word? What is it that we can't understand? Why is it so many Christians in this modern age, they live like the rest of the world? They, they, they enjoy so much of this sinful world that it, it, it's detrimental to their spiritual health. Talk about the COVID virus. Well, I tell you, sin has ruined more lives than the virus will ever do. Or all the viruses combined. Because the Bible tells us that uh, sin came upon all men because of that little thing that happened in the, that little thing that happened. That happened in the Garden of Eden back here in Genesis chapter 3. But I will tell you this, please listen, is that this new life in Jesus Christ is so new, God calls you a new creature. He calls you a different person. He calls you a peculiar people. I don't mean strange. Peculiar, if you look it up, the word means a special possession of God. So that's a peculiar treasure. We're special in God's eyes. Listen, God gave his son... For the whole world, for God so loved the world, John 3, 16, he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him, whosoever believeth in him, not whosoever goeth to a church building, not whosoever prays a prayer, it's for whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Listen, everlasting life can only happen because of the resurrection. And that everlasting life will last as long as God lives. And he's eternal. Praise God for that. I mean, amen. It's a wonderful thing. So when Jesus left this earth, for the final time, before he comes back again to receive those who love him, uh, those who love him, if you love God, you will obey God, you'll keep his word, and we're not too good at that. We still have a sinful nature that we wrestle with on every day. But, we have the power to overcome that. We no longer have to live sinful lives. We don't longer have to satisfy the lust of our flesh because we could obey God. We could uh, submit our members as servants unto righteousness where before we served them unto sin. Whatever my hands wanted to do before I got saved, I, I just did it with them. Wherever my feet wanted me to go, I, wherever my mind wanted my feet to go, my feet took me there. I could go to the tavern, I could go to the dance halls, I could go uh, to the movies, I could do things that are just crazy uh, in, on, on this side of being saved. 
Now, I know that you like your worldly activities and, and all of that, but I will tell you, you're missing out on some of the greatest things that God has to offer us. Now, why is it, how is it that we can have this power? Jesus said, when he left his disciples and ascended up in heaven, he says, all power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. You can look around, you can tell in your newspaper, on your, on your uh, nightly news, uh, uh, that the devil is very active and alive. The Bible calls him the God of this world, 2 Corinthians 4, 4. You have to understand that everything that happens isn't God, God controlling things. God does not control anything. He controls his temper, thankfully, but I want to tell you that he rules over all. His word is truth, and he's going to judge us by his word. Jesus said, the word that I have spoken to you, the same will judge you in the last day. So when Jesus says, leave that alone and take this up, he says, put that aside, take up your cross and follow me. It wasn't kidding around, because those are the things we'll be judged by. Now, <clears throat> in John chapter 1, verse 12, it says, But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. So the benefit is a new life. You don't have to live your old uh, life that you live, uh, fulfilling every lust of the flesh, every desire of your heart. Uh, and oftentimes that involves alcohol, it in involves illicit sex, it involves uh, murderous thoughts, all of those things there that were detrimental, that were just sealing your fate and proving to you that you were not good and God had to do something to fix that problem. That's why Jesus came. He came to fix that problem. Now, it's one thing to believe Jesus is a historical figure. Do you believe he's still alive? And that's the whole thing. His death, burial, and his resurrection are what you must believe in. You say, well, I can't believe something like that. Well, you believe a lot of things that are pretty outrageous. And I will tell you that you know evolution is a fairy tale. And God will prove that out to you someday. In the beginning, God created the heaven and earth. He didn't start a little thing in motion and it's just like a, a snowball going down the hill got bigger and bigger and bigger and out of control. It's not that way at all. And you can see that everything is digressing. It's going downward in a downward, downward place. <clears throat> and our lives as Christians, they ought to be lifting up and lifting up and lifting up. Amen? Now that depends on you. Because God tells us in his word, he's given us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. We have the opportunity now. We have a choice. You see, before we just operated according to the works of the flesh. I saw that. I wanted that. I went there. I heard that. That sounded good to me. Now it's, what does God say? God says, uh, do this. Well, I don't know if I want to do that. Or I don't even know if I, I can do that. Oh, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me, though. You see, that's why Paul was able to say those things. Because he experiences these things, and God wants us to have these things active in our lives. It's not enough just being a nice person or a good person. Those people aren't going to heaven without faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus said in John chapter 14, verse 6, No man cometh unto the Father but by me. <laughs> You have to, Jesus is the door. You have to go through him for salvation. You have to go through him if you're ever going to get to heaven up in the glory to be with him and the heavenly father. Now, now, so we have this power to live a new life, a changed life. Many a person in the, uh, in the hospital bed tries to make a deal with God. Many a person languishing in a prison house uh, just would like to do things all over again. And praise God, Oftentimes, there's an opportunity to do that. But I will tell you, if you're sincere about getting a new life, changing your heart, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, because this power will become available to you. And that's the only way you get it, by trust in Jesus Christ as the risen Savior. Is he your Savior? Okay, so the benefit of his shed blood is forgiveness of sins. It says, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. Sins aren't washed away in the water. Well, baptism is just a picture of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We fill up the tank with water. We go into the tank. We, we get the testimony from the new believer. We say, okay, I baptize you, my brother or my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried with him in baptism. 
risen again into newness of life. So it's a whole picture. Same thing with the Lord's Supper. Many call it the Mass. Uh, it, the Lord's Supper uh, was, or the Last Supper, whatever, however that term wants to come out of your heart, that's up to you. But the Bible tells us that it's a picture. It's got nothing to do with cleansing your insides. It's got nothing to do with uh, offering you salvation or uh, grace or anything like that. It's a picture. The broken wafer is, is a picture of Christ's body that was bruised and beaten for us. He was marred more than any man. The uh, uh, fruit of the vine, uh, if you're drinking hooch, or you're drinking uh, 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 Mountain Dew, <laughs> uh, or if you're drinking whiskey or, or wine or whatever you call it like that, that's not what they were drinking. They're drinking the fruit of the vine. This is, this is purified grape juice. And he... He, uh, it, it's not his real blood. You can't say some magic words over that thing and turn to blood. It's impossible. Stop believing that foolishness. Believe the Bible. Believe the Word of God. Amen? That's the best benefit for you. So this new life, it, it could be a life filled with joy and hope, even in the worst of times. Even in the troublous times that come into your life and take you by surprise or sideswipe you or just run right into your head on. Those problems come to every man, even believers. And believers are the ones who uh, are able to overcome those situations simply by the, the, the situation that the Holy Spirit dwells with inside them. Now, we can grieve the Holy Spirit. And oftentimes we do grieve the Holy Spirit. How do we grieve Him? By not obeying the, the uh, things that Jesus would have us to do. What would He have us to do? Well, let's see. He told us to love one another. He said, well, you don't sound very loving. You sound like mean and angry. I said, well, listen, I, I, if... Because I tell you the truth, have I become your enemy? <laughs> Paul had to say that. Now, I want to tell you also this. I know I'm saying I want to tell you an awful lot, but I want to tell you something. <laughs> the power of God's forgiveness and the freedom from the guilt of what we once did, or what we once were. That's another blessing from it. The shed blood is, of course, by this man came uh, remission of sins. His shed blood. There's power for everybody in the entire world to become a child of God. Uh, John chapter 1 verse 12, but as many as received him, have you received him? I'm not talking to you take away, but that's not receiving Jesus. That's not Jesus, sorry. That's believing, believing that Christ is risen from the dead and God will save your soul. We've got the power of the Holy Spirit in us that gives us boldness. Uh, a Holy Spirit-filled life is available for every believer. Every child of God, every born-again child of God has this uh, abundant life uh, that would fill you uh, for, for uh, becoming a Spirit-filled believer. What is a Spirit-filled believer? Is the one who goes walks around happy all the time? No. Although joy is a great part of it because it's part of the fruit of the Spirit of God. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, temperance, faith, all these things are the fruit of the Spirit of God that indwells the believer. Now, think about this as we go forward. That life is available to every believer. But how many times do you uh, manifest love? Or are you particular about who you love or what you love? What about the peace? Do you have peace in your heart? Do you have the peace that passes all understanding? Do you have joy? You have joy unspeakable and full of glory. I will tell you these things are there. But how have you tapped into that power of the resurrection? Have you tapped into the power of the Spirit of God living inside of you? I'll tell you, your, your life as a, as a non-believer could have been way down here. You could have been the lowest of the low. Paul called himself, as I said earlier, the chiefest of sinners. <clears throat> well, you get to the point where you can call yourself the chief of sinners. Now you're going somewhere. Now you look up. God lifts you up. And he tells us that he would bless us and give us grace to, do, to have a life that's pleasing unto God. So, <clears throat> let's, let's say what would be the effect on the church today, throughout the world, if every believer understood the power of Christ's resurrection and wanted to know it, wanted to experience it in their life. Well, they'll turn the world upside down. That's what happened back then. 
We took, you know, preaching the gospel, boldness, just mentioning the name of Christ, not using it anymore as a curse word, not taking it in vain. Here's another thing, another way you can take God's name in vain is by claiming to be his and you're living like the devil. So keep those things in mind. The believer is established by grace. I'm going to read to you some things out of the book of Ephesians. <clears throat> the letter to the church at Ephesus by the Apostle Paul. There's a whole list of things in chapter 1 and getting into, into chapter 2. And I'm just going to mention some of these things to you. Uh, blessed, in verse 3, chapter 1, says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Now, I'll tell you, if you're inclined to listen to the uh, material gospel uh, preachers on TV who say, God wants you to have a great house, he wants you to have a great car, he wants you to have good clothes, he wants your refrigerator to be overflowing with the best of foods. Uh, that's not what we're blessed with. We're blessed with spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. According as he hath chosen us. He chose us in him before the foundations of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. You see? So he's chosen us to live that way, that we would be holy and without blame before him in love. In other words, loving it, loving that lifestyle. But where do we, where do we fit in with that? Where's our level of love? Are we shallow Christians? Or are, we, are we excited and uh, walking in the Spirit of God? It's our choice. You see, when we didn't know Christ, we made choices based on what's it going to do for me? You know, I, you make choices to say, well, yeah, I think I'll make friends with that person because maybe I can get something out of them or they know somebody I know that I'd like to get involved with here. So we utilize those things in a very tricky way. And, you know, uh, we can make those choices. And we really couldn't do anything about it because the Spirit of God was not in us. We didn't believe the Word of God. We didn't believe... Uh, well, we might have learned that Jesus rose from the dead, but the power was unavailable to us. Only when we're born again does that become available. So, now, as newborn believers, now we have a choice. Now I can not do that. Now I can please God or I can please myself. I can love my neighbor or I can hate my neighbor. You see? You see how that goes? I can love my wife. I can abuse my wife. You see? There's choices with that. But be it known unto you, brethren, that there is a judgment day coming. And God will not spare. God will not spare. He will, he will judge in righteousness because he's righteous and he's holy. So, what else is it? We've been given a fearless spirit of power and love and of a sound mind. Think about this. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse number 7, Paul writes, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear. God takes that out of us. You say, well, then how come I get nervous around people? How come I, I, I feel afraid? That's because you're not uh, utilizing the power of the spirit of God because God says he's given us the, not the spirit of fear, but the spirit of power and of love. Oh, I don't think I could love that person. I don't know why that guy does that anyway. It really bothers me. Listen, God has given you the ability, the power of love, to love the unlovable. God loved you, right? He called you an enemy. He called you the someone that was against him before you got saved. Oh, you might have been singing in the choir. You might have been preaching the word of God. You might have been witnessing to somebody. You might have had a Bible at home and read it and, you know, understood some things. But I tell you, before you got saved, you were an enemy of God. It tells you that in Ephesians chapter 2 and, uh, and chapter 1. So remember those things. Uh, God has given us uh, the spirit of a sound mind. How sound is your mind? Listen, if you don't know the scriptures, if you haven't read the, the scriptures and, and, and understand what it is God wants from you, he wants from you obedience, he wants from you love. Because Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my words. Not on a shelf in your library or next to your bed, but you'll, you'll memorize the word of God, you'll know what the word of God is, and you'll practice that word of God. That's the most important thing. James says, 
It's not enough to be a hearer of the word. We have to be a doer of the word as well. So we're, we see this now. Uh, God's given us those things. Uh, we're safe in God's hands. Uh, it, it, the Bible tells us in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 5, we are kept by the power of God. People say, well, I'm afraid to lose my salvation. You can't lose salvation. Uh, people who think that way, they, they're not utilizing God's word for their benefit. Who are kept by the power of God through faith, not by the things you do, but through faith of the salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Again, throughout the New Testament, you will find the words faith. You will find the words believe. You will find the words trust. You will find them not only in the New Testament, but in the Old Testament. And this is what God desires. He wants your trust. He, he wants your love. He wants you to believe him. And that's what's the difference between being saved and being lost. But this changed life, the power of a changed life, Listen, if it weren't for the resurrection, we wouldn't even think about, well, what will happen to me when I die? Will I, will I get to go to be with the Lord? Yes, if you have trusted Jesus Christ. Well, what if I haven't been all that I should be? Who has? I mean, let's be honest. Who has? We all struggle with temptations. We all struggle with sin. But, you see, now we have a choice. Now we don't have to do that. We don't have to go there. We can just please God. So well, that's boring. Oh, yeah, you think that's boring. Well, what, what do you think about judgment standing before the holy risen Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, at the judgment, and think about what you're going to be thinking at that moment? Okay, Jude is only one chapter. Verse 24 says, Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling. Listen, your husband's not able to keep you from falling. Your wife's not able to keep you from falling. Your pastor's not able to keep you from falling. But God is able to keep you from falling. And so he says he's able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. Isn't that exciting? I think about that. Sometimes you hear the word of God and it sounds like we're, we're clanging a, a cymbal uh, uh, without any noise. Blowing a trumpet, no sounds coming out. Just praise God for his word, brethren. I'm telling you this, it's so important. So, again, in Ephesians... He's predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. You're always thinking about your own good pleasure. Well, you ever think about the good pleasure of God, his will? That's what's important. And now he's made us accepted in the beloved. I'm reading these things right out of Ephesians chapter 1. And verse 7 says, In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. He is abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence. He's made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself. You see, it's not about you. It's about God. It's about the Son of God. It's about the resurrection. It's about the promises of God. And he's reaching out and saying, here, take my hand and believe me. Come with me. Follow me. You see that? God is the God of love. He's not the God of the Muslims. He's the God of, uh, he just wants to kill you if you don't believe uh, uh, Muhammad. This is the risen Lord Jesus Christ, the King of glory. I will tell you this. Read Revelation chapter 1 and get a good glimpse of what Jesus looks like today. He's not the lowly Galilean anymore. He's the warrior king coming back in power and might, taking vengeance on them that know not God and obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Check it out. It's in the Bible. I'm telling you, you're safe in the hands of Jesus. Again, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance. Uh, verse 13, in whom he also trusted after that you heard the word of truth and you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. And you are a purchased possession. I want, I want to tell you, before, before we leave, uh, after this preaching message, that there is so much that God wants for you as his child. Now, not everybody's a child of God. We're only children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Look it up. It's in the scripture. That, that's the whole verse. I know modern man, they cut off the half of the verse that says, by faith in Christ Jesus, but that's the whole key. It's only by faith in Christ Jesus. 
So that leaves a lot of religionists out of the picture, but doesn't, doesn't prevent them from coming the way God wants them to come. Now, um, what, so, so looking at these truths, we understand that God is for us, and if God be for us, who can be against us, Christian? Listen, God will keep his word, every, every last dot, every last crossing of the T, and I will tell you that he is a God of truth, and his love exceeds the love of anything you've ever experienced in your life. And the best way to experience the joy and the peace that passes anything this world has to offer, the love that anything uh, that you can think of, any person you can think of could fill you with, it's the love of Jesus Christ. And, and he's the risen Lord Jesus Christ. And if it weren't for the resurrection of Jesus Christ, there'd be no resurrection for us. What a waste, what a waste all this stuff would be. Well, praise God, that's not how it's going to be. So with that in mind, I will just leave you, and thank you so much for tuning in today as we explore uh, future uh, messages from the Word of Truth and what God's done for us. We hope to see you then. God bless you until this whole thing's over and we get to meet together once again. Love you, and praise God for you in Jesus' name. Amen.